After Juma, we have a short dars on the Hadith. And um, if you remember, I had sort of said that uh, I'll look at the technical aspects of Hadith rather than just saying the story of Prophet Muhammad, how this whole thing came about. And I thought it was going to take uh, two or three, perhaps four, of these lectures, discourses, discussions, whatever you want to call them. But the more uh, I look into it, the more I come to the conclusion that I'd still be standing here in ten years' time, still talking about the various technical aspects of uh, Hadith. And um, as I said previously, I'm actually amazed at the dedication of the Muhaddisin and the Imams of Hadith and so on. And I'm amazed at how much love they must have had for the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to go to all the trouble of collecting these uh, Hadiths. There was one Imam, I forget his name now, who was in Baghdad and he heard that uh, a companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, who was still alive, narrates a hadith that uh, he hadn't heard uh, before. So he packed uh, his stuff, put it on a camel, and he travelled all the way from Baghdad to Medina, where this companion was, just to hear that one sentence and make sure that he, it, it had got to him accurately. I mean, just think of the journey in those days, by foot or by camel or horse, and the amount of time it, it must have taken. It must have taken him months and months to get there, just, just for, you know, this one minute uh, that it took to check the, uh, the Hadith. Now, each Hadith is divided into two parts. One is called Rabayat, and the other one is called Daraya. Rawayat is the names of the people who related that hadith. This person said to that person, who said, mentioned it to that person, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad said. And the interesting thing is, that part has given rise to a huge study. It's called Ilmu Rijal, knowledge of science of people. And every single person who's mentioned in any hadith, people have traced his whole background, who his wife was, who his children were, who his mother was, who his father was, who his great parents <coughs> were, what did he do, what kind of person was he, if someone uh, uh, gave him something in trust, did he return it to that person or not, if he borrowed money, did he return the money, if he was a trader, did he try to trick his, his, his customers into paying more than was due? Did he try and sell dodgy uh, or imperfect goods and so on? Would, would his uh, evidence be acceptable in, 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 a, in a court of law? And there are books, books upon books upon books. And all these books have is each person, you know, like if I say that uh, Zaman told me, that Khansab told him, that or in Mustaf told him. So this person would sit down, and he'd write a whole biography of me. That on Zaman, that on Khansab, that on Mustaf. Why? To either try and prove that that hadith is correct, or try and disprove. So they looked at this man's qualities, this man's nature, what he did, what work he did, was he a trader, was he an employee, was he a slave, and so on and so on. And it's actually absolutely amazing the trouble they went to. Because obviously, you know, it's common sense. If a man is proven to be a lawyer, how can we ex expect him to uh, communicate to us the words of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallam accurately and correctly? Is he doing it for some other reason? Is he doing it to make himself more influ influential or 
famous or you know for some monetary gain, etc., etc. So, and the the uh, apart from uh, this knowledge that uh, mushroom, the imams of hadith had two sets of rules: one for the narrators of the hadith, which has some of the things I've mentioned, the man's qualities, uh, etc., etc., and the other one about uh, and the other set of rules about the text. Of the, of the Hadith itself. Now, so that's the first part. This person said to that person, said to that person, that the Holy Prophet Muhammad uh, told me this. And then, after checking the qualities of these people, they then check the connection between these people. Could it be right that, you know, Zaman could have told me this? Well, Zaman was, uh, was on holiday in Guyana when I said he told me this. So how can I <coughs> you know, am I telling the truth? Uh, and so on. So they then did a whole history on these connections, whether it's possible that these people could have met. And Imam Bukhari was first he wanted these people to have actually not only met but there to be proof that they have met. It's not enough that the man in Mustaq and Khan Sabinai we come to this mosque to say I give a prayer. So the possibility is that this chain existed. Imam Bukhari said, the no, possibility is not good enough. These are the words of our Prophet. I want proof that Shahid met Zaman. I want proof Zaman met Khansab. I want proof that Khansab met Mustaq. And I want all of these people to be honest, reliable, truthworthy, upstanding before I would admit that the Prophet could have said these, uh, these things. And then, they set up similar conditions for the text. They didn't just accept uh, uh, anything. I'll give you one example of the trouble that these Muhammadan and Imams took to try and check that what they heard was actually uh, said by the Holy Prophet Muhammad. But then they set up other conditions. Like, you know, this Hadith says that the Holy Prophet says anyone who eats camel steak will be able to fly. To give a ridiculous example, they would say, well, nature says men can't fly just because they eat camel steak. So someone's made this up. So that was the rule, uh, a rule they had, that, you know, hadith must not defy nature. Despite the fact that these days there are people who believe that the Holy Prophet went about with a cloud over his head so that, uh, you know, to protect him from the sun. <coughs> trees bowed to him and talked to him, etc., etc. He vowed for these, they don't believe in these things. So someone said, the Holy Prophet said something which was against nature, they said, this can't be right. Again, uh, another rule was, if the Holy Prophet said something, in fact, Holy Prophet himself had said that, if something is reported to be being said by the Holy Prophet, and it's against the Holy Quran, then the Holy Prophet can't have said and so on and so forth. So there are lots of these rules that they, they set up. And you know, there are people who uh, criticize Hadith and they think, well, you know, something just came into someone's head and he said it and everyone started believing it and, you know, uh, it became a uh, Hadith and so on. It wasn't like that. These people did so much research, they did it took so much trouble they set up so many rules. And interestingly, and I've commented on this before, that this was the first time that someone actually set up standards by which historical research should be judged. Previously, people would say, oh, you know, I've been so and so, and it looks like this and this and that and so on. Or people made up some fanciful story about their parents or, you know, generations gone by and others would believe them. But they set up these standards of historical measure. How do you actually write accurate history, uh, etc. Um, now, next week, hopefully, I'll go through some of these rules that they set up for checking people and for checking the text of the, uh, of the Hadith. And we'll see how meticulous these people were in their endeavors.